Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Kevin Strike. I'm here with Alex Beddoes. Hey, Mom. Hey, so um, month of December, usually a good time to, to play around on the ArtStation Marketplace. Yeah, it's it's actually probably one of my biggest learning spikes is around Christmas time because it's kind of I'm taking a break from work and I always take the opportunity to grab some stuff, some assets um, or tutorials and just use it as an opportunity to really have some focused learning time. It's one of the few times of the year where you actually have that, t- you know, you're not under any pressure from work or school. So yeah, is I know I do that on the every year is grab something off the marketplace and just really use it as an opportunity to learn something new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, lots of people already doing that. Reference packs, tutorials, brushes, uh, anything, and uh, usually the prices are pretty low and pretty good. So you can either get good deals by buying something or take a little bit of time and uh, and make some side income. Um, okay. Um, now for the podcast, uh, if you like the podcast, feel free to subscribe, leave us a rating review and write to us. We, we, we want to hear from you. Write to us at podcast at artstation.com. Okay. This was a fun episode. We chatted with Lois Van Barla, um, also known on, on social media as Lois. Um, really nice conversations where we, we talked a lot about being an independent artist, a freelance artist. Yeah, it's one of the things I found really interested was also like cultivate her style. Like um, she has a very unique style. And I think traditionally when you talk to people who wanted to get into the industry, they deter away from certain things. And I think Lois sticking to her guns and you know really sticking with her style and cultivating that was it's interesting hearing her journey about that but also as an independent artist like it's a lot of people talk about independent art as this very great thing is it's you know it's so fun you get to do what you want but it was really cool to hear Lois talk about the risk versus reward factor that comes with it and how she has to like change the way she puts her art forward depending on the platform mm-hmm. there's lots of social media out there you know twitter uh, patreon art station um you know, even like linkedin and facebook so the fact that she acknowledged the fact that you have to put your, your content out slightly differently depending on mm-hmm. the platform was really good mm-hmm. for her to touch on because again, it's not spoken about very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She, um, as, as well as spending some time in studio, she, we, yeah, I enjoyed those parts where we were talking about being an independent artist, how she views the, the platforms a little bit differently, how she yeah, is very methodical about it. Um, yeah. And just thinking about, uh, the different ways, like, as you mentioned, yeah, of what you should post on, on different platforms. Uh, she spent a lot of time thinking about it. That was fun. Also talking about Aloy and the mm-hmm. development of that character. That was pretty cool. Uh, of course, from horizon zero down zero dawn, sorry. Um, great game. <laughs> great game. Have you played that game? Yeah. It's one of my favorites. It's, uh, it's one of the games, which actually what's what's the nice way to say this. Um, Gave me hope for the industry. It was just so mm-hmm. unique. It was beautiful. It was colorful. It wasn't just gray, grungy stuff. So it really kind of reignited my love for gaming. Mm-hmm. And there's a, an update coming for PS5 that mm-hmm. that I'm looking forward to, to checking out. Uh, as well as getting actually a PS5. I've been watching online to see if I <laughs> also doubt I need to get my hands on one of those. Um she also mentioned uh, pressures that are put on young artists and kind of the heart she has for young artists. Um, and um, mm-hmm. of course, we talk a little bit about developing her art style. So that was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. All right. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Hi, Lois. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's really uh, fun to have you on board. And um, yeah, if, Funny enough, during these uh, COVID times, a lot of us uh, haven't been able to see each other on the conference circuit. I know you you go around a lot. How have you been doing uh, in these times having to stay at home? It's been a challenge um, because I, like, as an artist, as a freelance artist, it's really easy to work from home, right? So uh, it hasn't been like I've had the luxury of just figuring out my own way of handling that. And I also have a studio space outside of the house that I don't share with anybody. So it's I can just still go there. Um, so that part of my life hasn't changed too much, but the traveling, like no longer traveling is a huge bummer. Um, I've noticed that like, for me, the change of scenery of traveling and meeting new people is, is something that I really miss right now. So I've been trying to like book, I've, I've found that there are a lot of tiny houses here in the Netherlands all around. And I've, I've booked a couple of weekends away as a substitute, but it's, it's not the same <laughs> as like traveling and meeting new people. So I really miss that. 
Have you found it that you've had to change the business a little bit with not seeing, seeing people and, uh, and the kind of the business that's generated by, by you going around and um, seeing people at the cons and so on. Yeah. Yeah. It has changed. I mean, like um, most of my, like I used to give workshops on average once a month and that uh, completely fell away and I still do some online events, but it's not really the same uh, in terms of as well, like how many there are and the income that can be generated from it. So that part of my income kind of fell away and I filled it up with other stuff. So I started, it's very lucky that I started focusing on my Patreon this year because that kind of filled up that gap and gave me something else to focus on, something totally new. Um, but I really had to like, I had to adapt quickly to, to that, to having to change the business structure in that way for the year. Just on the Patreon side of things, what um, kind of made you decide to to focus on that? Because I bet for you as an artist, it's quite good because it's all about you just being you as an artist. It's not working for an outside entity. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's been really great to work on because, uh, I used to really balance my time between like workshops and events and then like client work. Um, and the workshops were really a way for me to talk about my own work and share knowledge about that. And also create my own drawings during the workshop, like as a live demonstration. And now um, and if I had filled up like that, those missing sort of time slots with just client work, I wouldn't have had enough time to do my own thing. So having Patreon there, it keeps my creativity flowing, you know, because it's really important for me to do my own stuff uh, from time to time, just so that I can reconnect with my own creativity and focus on what I want to learn and what I want to explore. So that's, that's been awesome. What? Is that that you want to, like, when you say learn, I'm always curious about, you know, when you've got artists who are, you know, have very successful, I'm always kind of curious about the idea of what their learning look like looks like. Because I spend a lot of my time mentoring, like, you know, students, um, people pre-industry, and it's like, it's, it's very black and white what they need to learn. Here's your key skills you need to learn, go learn them, you might be able to get a job. At your stage, like, what sort of things do you look into to learn? What sort of things do you want to develop? Well, lately, um, because the last three years or so, uh, the amount of client work that I did, like got more and more and more and more and became very intense, which is why I decided to change course and focus on the Patreon. Um, I, what I really missed in, in those years of focusing on client work was, um, just like making studies of things like, just drawing rocks and like learning how the rock looks, you know, or just drawing plants. Cause I am very character focused artist and I do character design as my work. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable in the realm of characters, but pushing it, like expanding that world and kind of learning how the details look and trying to stylize and simplify things. Like I've done a lot of like random studies for my Patreon so far. Like I've done like wave studies where I literally just took a wave and I, and I drew it in my style and that kind of stuff I really missed before. It's like a kind of playful approach, exploratory ap approach towards drawing that I just didn't have the time for, uh, before. So that's what I've been doing. And I've noticed that that's sort of also kind of deepened the, the detail level in my paintings as well. And, and that's sort of like, a you know, each one feeds the next, every time I make a painting, I think, Oh, I really want to learn how, how to draw this kind of thing better. And then I make studies, um, and then I sort of put that back into my next painting and it, it kind of keeps the curiosity flowing for me. Yeah. It's, it's quite interesting. Cause like you, you're right. Cause I, I've known you always for your character. Right? And it's always been the characters, a uh, kind of center stage and the background's always really nice color palettes or patterns. Yeah. So when I, yeah, I, I mean, I follow on social media when I started seeing like, um, the one which caught my eye was the, the plant studies. Like you did like yeah. a few plant studies together and I was like, Oh, these are really cool. Like, this is really interesting. Like I, it kind of took me by surprise. I didn't expect this for, uh, from you. And now you're doing all these sorts of environments and you know, the waves are really cool. The waves, I think I did the rounds on social media quite a few times because it caught yeah. a lot of people's eyes. Yeah, I have so much fun doing them. I think that's what people see in it too. They, I think that inspires other artists to be like, well, how would I do that actually? You know, cause it's so simple in its concept and it's just rooted in curiosity. So that's why I love doing it. So just I'll, one thing I'm curious about the, with the character side of stuff, back you know when you're you were first starting out you you have a very distinct style um you know people your work is synonymous with the style and i can't help but feel like early on it must be quite difficult to stick with this style i you know when you're teaching students it's like oh here's the stuff the ind industry's doing 
if you want a job or you want to make a career out of this, go do what they do. Your stuff has consistently been your style. Like, is did you face that at mo- any point in your career where you're kind of like having to go, okay, I have what I like to do, but there's that, the, the industry's happening over there. Maybe I should tailor my stuff over there. Because you, you've stayed true to it the whole time. What did that look like? What opposition did you face during that time? Um, well, so I think that it's it's funny that you bring up style because I'm actually like I spent today uh, working on my third art book that's coming up and it's going to focus specifically on style. So I've been writing about this today. So I have like so many thoughts on this. Um, okay. But I basically always had like I think I developed a distinct style because I always knew what it was that I wanted to achieve with art. Uh, I've always had a very clear uh, not like a clear vision in terms of that I planned it out, but I've just always looked at things and noticed very specific things about them that I wanted to recreate. So my style is a lot about like the characters, getting a sense of familiarity, um, the volumes, like the certain color use, because that kind of reflected like this, like I, a strong desire to capture that in my art. And I don't think I ever developed it as a sort of like marketing tool, although it turned out to be really useful in that sense. But it's much more like this is just what I love the most. This is what I what I really enjoy about drawing. And I always uh, held on to that because I'm self-taught. So I always did it my own way. And um, in terms of career, like I never really planned out a career in the same sense. So I never thought like, okay, what can I do with uh, with my career? I want uh, Do I want to be this or that? I never really thought too much about that. Um, the reason that I studied animation was because I knew that it would teach you a really broad range of skills. Like you'd learn to do backgrounds, you'd learn to animate, storyboard, you know, uh, write a concept, do character design. I had such a broad range that I was like, I'll figure it out. But I never really figured it out. I just always thought like, as long as I have those skills, I'll find a way to use them. I'll just see what happens. And what ended up happening was that I was approached for to do work when I graduated because I'd already built up a, a presence on DeviantArt and on social media. And, and so like companies would come up to me in the beginning, very small ones. Like I didn't start with a like amazing um, resume or anything like that. It was just really small scale stuff. But people would come up to me and be like, oh, I could really picture you making this for us. I could picture you making that for us. And over time, I sort of rolled into character design. And and I think the reason why like my style hasn't felt limiting to me is because I did what I really like to do. And um, I, I attracted certain kinds of work to me by doing that. And I didn't have to change myself to get into that industry. The industry kind of saw how I could be used for their projects. And I am also very lucky in the sense that like female characters, for example, it was a lot harder to make a living. I think drawing a lot of female characters, if you weren't doing like Disney princess kind of stuff before, and now there's like a lot of interesting stories, games, you know, comics, animations with interesting female leads that I get like hired for. So there's a lot of changes that took place in the industry that happened to fit really well with the kind of stuff that I was making. But it, it always started with me just doing what I really love. And that kind of like formed my path. So I, I never felt the pressure to do anything different than what I was doing. I was very lucky in that sense. Along the way, have you felt though a tension between um, like, this is what the client wants or this is what the audience wants versus what's most important to you is that you're making something that you're proud of and you're going to a specific goal that you see in mind. Like, was there, was there a tension playing in your head? Um, not, not really, because when I work on projects, I tend to just kind of like, not, um, like I do what I enjoy, but I don't, um, feel like it has to be at a certain level. Um, I just kind of go with it and see what I can get out of it. And I think that, you know, that's, that, that was another benefit of not really planning it out too much and being like, this is what I want my career to look like. I had a lot of friends who did that. They were like, I want a certain type of animation career. And then they would work on projects and be like, I don't want my name in the credits of it because it doesn't fit with the quality of work that I want my name attached to. But I always had something like, well, whatever, you know, as long as I'm, I'm generating some income and it'll always be a learning experience. And I never felt too perfectionistic about the project itself. I just tried to contribute in whatever way I could and then just move on. And what helped with that is that I always had my own stuff on the side. So whatever I didn't like about the project, I could just put it aside and focus on what matters to me the, the most, which is my own stuff. 
So I always kept that perfectionism and intense drive of like, this is how it should look and how it should be for my own thing. I am committed to the projects that I work on, but I try to like let leave those decisions to the decision makers, like the art directors, the directors, and kind of respect their decision and not get too involved in. Um, and I've had the question asked to me, like, what kind of project would you do if you had all the freedom, like you could do it totally your way. And then I have a total blank. Like, I don't know what I would do. So right. I don't have, I don't, I just think that part of my brain is not really active when I'm working on these projects. I'm just trying to see what my role is. Yeah, exactly. Is it like being asked, hey, draw something cool? Yeah. And, or, and I'm like, well, I don't <laughs> know what that is. You have to give me cool. something. Yeah. There has to be some sort of box to work with well, in whatever that it's, is. Yeah, I think exactly. It's with yeah. problem solvers. Like, that, I think that's the thing with concept artists, like an artist in general, we're all problem solvers. That's why blank yeah. canvases are so scary because there's not a problem to be solved. Whereas if you're posed with, okay, we need a female lead, uh, she's a warrior, and like, this is the world. It's like, oh, great. I have some things to start with. It's like when exactly. I, you, you know, you'll get people ask you for portfolio reviews. I imagine whenever someone says, "Just review my portfolio," it's like, "Oh, okay, what, what, yeah, what about? Like, exactly. where do you want to go?" Yeah, I always have this thing like, "What do you want to achieve?" You know, like, "What, what are you trying to do?" And also with like my client work in general, I, I, I really enjoy it because not because of the work that I do on its own, but because of the um, interaction with the art director, like sitting down with them and being like, what are you, what are we going for? And making those first sketches and seeing what they respond to and what they like the most and what sparks their imagination. And then kind of learning how to, how to navigate that, like that interactive element of it is what really makes it an interesting challenge for me and fun. This is something I think people, younger artists actually probably, it'll help them to hear is that that element that back and forth, the dialogue between you and the creatives around you is probably where the most fun is. And yeah. it's also probably the most important skill because like you don't work in a vacuum, commercially speaking. Yeah. We don't work in vacuums. Like you have to work with teams and like you said, show something that resonates with somebody. Oh, I don't like this. I do like that. It's probably one of the, from just people I speak to at the moment, it's the most undervalued, I don't want to call it a skill, but part of the job. Like you have to communicate. Yeah, you have to communicate. You have to like... As, cause I know like as an, as a concept artist, you want to nail it, you know, you always want to like instantly nail it, but there's an art to like not doing that at all. And just sending like your mindless, like totally random scribbles as your first pass. And then just seeing how, who responds to it, what do they say? What are they seeing in it? You know, and, and using that as a way to navigate a process, because every time that I've handled it that way and kind of like left something open for, you know, the rest of the, the team and the art director to kind of say, push it in a certain direction. I always um, made art that I didn't even think that I could make. Like it always took me way above, um, what I knew I could create because I was getting this extra input and like feeding off of someone else's vision and trying to mix that with mine. Mm -hmm. Is that what was um, particularly exciting about working on Aloy and the, yeah. and, and that game and is, it, is it what attracted you to, uh, to that? How did, how did that come about? Maybe to take people back, how did you get approached to work on this character and why did you accept uh, to work on it? Um, well, in, in this particular case, I, uh, had never worked in AAA games. I had done a lot of casual games and a lot of like click and point adventures and, um, like a lot of small scale stuff. That's like, it all disappeared when flash went away. Uh, but I'm still really happy with what I did. It was like awesome to work on, but they were very small projects. And then, um, uh, at Gorilla, um, one of the UI designers, who knew my work, heard them, overheard them saying that they were looking for a concept artist, um, for, to work on like the next pass of Aloy. Cause they already had some concepts for her, but they it needed some work. And, uh, the UI designer reached out to me and was like, Hey, they're looking for an artist here. You should do this. Like, I think you would be such a good match. And he was just a fan of my work. He just knew my work from uh, Tumblr or something. And, um, and then he contacted them within the company and was like, I, I know a good artist for you. And then he, he told me to contact Gorilla and that's how we kind of met. And they were like, particularly interested. I think they, they saw the connection in my work because they wanted to move away from like the hyper-realistic stuff and, and go more for like, um, they wanted like the personality of animation concept art. 
in, in some of the work, at least some people wanted that other people at Gorilla were not big on that. So that was sort of like an internal thing that was going on. Um, and they also just, I'm Dutch. So I, and I'm in the Netherlands, so it was easy for them because they bring in a lot of artists from all over the world. Right. But if they have somebody who's in the Netherlands, it's just a lot more like low key and easy to get to work on. So that's how I got in touch with them. And I think we both didn't expect it to be such a good match. Uh, and it was a really good match. Um, they put me like exclusively on Aloy, which was super fun. Cause I feel like that's the whole thing that I had been working on was like working on female lead characters in all of my concept art. Like that's sort of the energy that I try to give all of the characters that I do, that they're like kind of like the main characters of their own story. Um, it was really cool to work in a stylized way, but they also really encouraged me to try like something a little more up in age. Cause I was making art that was very appealing to younger audiences. It still is. Um, I still make that kind of art, but at gorilla, they were like, you know, let's try and get it a little more mature, like play around with the proportions, like push the details, get more texture in there. And I learned so much. My art improved so much just from working with them and being challenged to do that. Uh, it was a really, really good match. So you say it's a good match. Were you aware of the games they worked on prior to... Because so Horizon, like, doing one of my favorite games. Yeah. I um, grew up on Killzone. And I remember yeah. hearing Horizon. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. I'm used to, like, like these futuristic Nazi zombies. Not, not like, you know, <laughs> this fantasy world of a female lead. is very shocking for me. Yeah. Did you, were you aware of that, like, coming in? Was, it, was there any hesitation? Or was it like, no, I've seen the concept. I've seen the IP. Like, you know, it was all in. You were happy. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I, when they first reached out I, or when I first, like when the UI designer was like, yeah, Gorilla's got a cool project for you. I was like, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you must be <laughs> the wrong person. But then I went there and they, they showed me their pitch. Like they had a, they had a whole pitch video ready for their idea. Um, because they'd actually been working on it for a really long time before I came in and it was just super convincing. I could hundred percent see like why they would want me to like contribute, you know? And also they, they had all of these aspects to it like this. I had just been on a vacation with my boyfriend and his parents to the U.S. going to all the national parks. And the whole thing was just super inspired by those that region, you know, like the Rockies and like all of these beautiful American landscapes. And I I was instantly like, oh, my God, I love those places, too. And there, there was so much like just that, that clicked when I saw the concept. But before that. No, I had, I was like, this isn't a thing for me. And also while I was working there, I was a little bit like, cause I'm not a gamer, um, mm -hmm. unless Minesweeper counts as being a gamer, but like, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely like not somebody who, who plays a AAA game. Like I really appreciate them. And I usually know, like I, I watch the playthroughs and everything and I'm aware of what's going on, but I don't play games myself. So I always felt like unqualified in a way to, to, um, to be creating artwork for it. But they always told me like, we want input from somebody who's looking at it more as an animation or as a film than as a game, because we have plenty of people working that here that know how the game will work and are gamers, but your input is not going to be that input. You're focusing on the character. You're trying to get like a, like an appealing quality to the character that could work in any medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's developed a lot in and transitioned a lot in recent decades and years, like to get the, the the line between game and film and and what goes into the the sequences and everything in the game and what's required for that. Um, I could see how the, yeah, just a focus on the character. What it was the time for that? Yeah. Yeah. And also I was in, I was early in the production and they were going to go through a whole process of translating whatever I made into like, you know, what they needed for the game. So it wasn't my role to make her like a playable character from the start. It was just to get her personality, to get, to get some kind of starting point for that translation process into the realistic, uh, 3d character. But I suppose also the fact that you're not from the gate, like, you know, like I said, you're not a gamer and all these kinds of things. You're, not there to solve the problem you're there to invoke the ideas too it's like hey here's what i'm thinking invoke from like a non-gamer perspective and i'm like oh that's left field we didn't think of that okay actually maybe we should be looking here i always felt that with any team like you don't want a bunch of people who are all from the exact same background because then you end up having the exact yeah. same ideas and you could be moving very efficiently in the wrong direction and nobody yeah. to say hey maybe we're doing this wrong maybe we should go over here um 
I just want to backtrack a little bit to, so you were, this was a freelance, like, was this a sort of freelance gig? Was it a contract gig? Because as an independent artist or like freelance artist, actually, I should probably backtrack that independent artist. Like I've always perceived you as an independent artist. Can we just clarify the term? Because I've heard it defined in a lot of different ways. Um, so your words, what do you see as like as an independent artist? Uh, well, I call myself a freelance artist. Okay. Okay. Um, because I generate most of my income from freelance work, although that's kind of changed now with the Patreon. So I guess you could say I'm an independent artist as well, but I always thought independent artist is somebody who, uh, just makes a living off of their own art, but maybe Mm -hmm. I'm getting a different, I think when you say that you mean like an artist who isn't working in house, like on a contract, who's like freelance i've heard it this is what i mean i've heard it put, i've heard it defined in many different ways so I, i've spoken to some yeah. people and they think independent artist is like, like i said just uh just a remote outsourcer like sort right. of contract artist and yeah, then yeah, i yeah. think well no i think of it as a someone who makes a, a living off their own artwork yeah uh, so it's worth, that's why I, this is what i mean i just wanted to clarify that yeah yeah because yeah, yeah, i have bits and pieces of each uh, i was working with gorilla as a freelancer i was looking at the possibility of maybe like working with them in the long term but then um honestly like it was so awesome working there but i did feel like a pull back to my own thing like everything that i learned at gorilla made me feel super excited to use that knowledge in my own art. And I knew that I couldn't give it up. So at first I worked with them full time for a couple of months and then sort of scaled down to three days in a week and then from time to time. So I did go back to sort of focusing on my own thing, but I kind of learned from that experience that my own thing is like way too important to me. Um, Mm -hmm. So your, and your own thing is defined as your, your Instagram, Twitter, um, also your Patreon and stuff like that is your outlet and it's, it's your thing so important to you that you have that and uh, want to develop that more. Yeah. And seriously, just literally just having a day where I just sit down and I think, what will I draw today? Like that is something that I need in my life. So I can definitely commit to projects full time for like, uh, you know, a couple of months, maybe even longer. I've done that before too, but like eventually I just really need some empty time in my schedule just for me to draw what I feel like and not even like just nothing planned, just whatever I feel like that day, something I just need it creatively. Cause otherwise if all my energy goes into the projects that I do, like the client work, then it burns out after a while. It just Mm -hmm. becomes so dictated by what the project needs that I, um, and I don't get to use that knowledge you know, cause whenever for a project, I like when I worked with Gorilla and I was trying out this more mature style, I just can't do that for months and then not draw a lowest drawing in a more mature style. Like I want to instantly use it for my own thing. So I need to have that um, present in my schedule. Well, uh, with this, so people are probably hearing this and this probably sounds like you're living a life. You get to have a day where you do your own artwork, you get to pick your projects, just working from home. Now, I imagine there's a lot of people out there probably listening and going, oh, that sounds like the life. That sounds amazing. There's a lot of stress involved in li- this lifestyle of freelance and commercial artwork and contract artwork, plus you know your own stuff. Probably worth just talking about that a little bit. Like what, what sort of stress is uh, like coming, ignoring the COVID stuff? Like, it's like yeah. there's a whole bunch of stuff that that for a spanner and works for. Yeah. As a contract artist or freelance artist, what kind of things come up? What stress is what? pitfalls are there because it's probably people listen to this thinking i want to do that that's like that's the dream (laughs) yeah um it sort of is the dream i mean when i think about how much freedom i have to choose my path forward that is amazing um and it's something that i always want to emphasize that i'm privileged in that sense like my story can't be applied to like literally any artist but i do think that um like the stress that it gives. Yeah. I have to be very active on social media because social media is the only reason that this is a possibility for me. It's the reason that clients come to me because they see my work on social media. So I get exposure there. Um, also it's the only reason why people would support me on Patreon because they see me posting about it frequently. Um, so I, I really have to keep that going and that is a second job. Uh, alongside an existing full-time job. Um, I have to, well, I don't have to, but I choose to post three times a week or more. 
which means a lot of content needs to be generated. Not all of that stuff is new art. Um, some of it is, is like process videos or like behind the scenes stuff or just a promo post saying like buy my book or whatever, but it is a constant thing that needs to keep going. And if I take a break from it, my, the algorithm will sort of lower the engagement that I get. Uh, so it has to constantly go and it's getting more and more challenging over time. Cause like back in the deviant art days an art station still works that way is that you can post every now and then, and then everybody who follows you will see what you post when, when they log in and see whatever's been up since they were last online. But Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that are like people, you have to post when people are online. And if people miss your post, they probably never see it again, you know? So you have to like constantly put stuff out there. Um, it's really hard. It, Instagram, you have to also post stories, you know? So I'm not only posting three times a week, but I'm also posting like daily little tidbits of my life. And it's such a huge part of my life. And it's the only reason why I have all these privileges because I have an online following and it's really hard to keep up with it. Um, it's like a treadmill, you know? So that that's very stressful. It's worth it, but it's not for yeah. everyone, you know? And so are you yeah. driving that... Um, Th th that side of, the, uh, of your life and business because you want it to maintain the kind of the level it's at right now, or is your goal that it would uh, take over everything and it would be able to, you'd just be able to focus on that? Um, I, d I keep it going because I just keep seeing the benefits that come from it, but I don't really have a plan on what specifically I want to do with it. So like I could live j only off of my own work, but that doesn't really make me happy um, because client work and like projects, they engage that part of my brain that like wants to be in a team that wants to be inspired by the project itself, that wants to work in a structured, more structured environment. Um, and then, so I need both in my life. Uh, so I'll always do some degree of client work, but I don't think that I would continue to get as much interesting client work if I didn't have social media because clients find me through social media and also events. I get invited to events through social media and all that stuff. It's all dependent on, on my online presence, which could disappear in a day. You know, if you yeah. don't, if you don't, if a platform, if Instagram crashes and just disappears the way Vine did, then off goes a big chunk of my income too. <laughs> so that's well, we kind didn't of even the scary part. Yeah, that is definitely, I think we've learned that in 2020, yeah. <laughs> when in 2019, if you would have asked us what we would be doing this year, we had a pretty good idea, but yeah. it's completely different. Um, yeah. I, I'm curious to, to dig a bit more. Uh, you started talking about the different platforms and how you, uh, you treat each one of them. Um, yeah, maybe you can go into a little bit more detail on that. Like when you're posting something to Instagram versus putting something on, on DeviantArt or ArtStation or, uh, yeah, those kind of things like the different audiences that um, are in each one of those platforms. Like, are you treating the posts differently? How are you interacting with the platforms and how, how aware are you of those different audiences? Uh, I think that that's essential. If you're going to post somewhere, like you kind of know like what the platform is for, because like, first of all, then you're not going to be tone deaf, you know, you're going to really understand, like you're, you'll be part of that community. But second of all, because the algorithms are always built in a way to prioritize the kind of content that the platform is made for. Um, so uh, each platform has its own definition, I think, of the kind of content it wants to see um, and why people come to it. Uh, ArtStation is a platform that really has the portfolio format and is a way to like look at people's most dazzling, most beautiful art. And as, and that's what I focus on there. You know, I, I post my best art and I, um, I don't do like multiple posts, like of all these different sketches I did. I bundle those all in one with my best stuff. Cause that's what ArtStation is about. And that's why I'm on ArtStation to look at other people's stuff. Cause I'm looking at like beautiful, dazzling professional portfolios. Instagram is much more like image focused and needs to be like constantly going and has a younger audience, a uh, much younger audience. So my tone of voice there is much more like, um, you know, suitable for a younger audience. So still my tone, but a bit friendlier, a bit more open and like, let's talk, let's have a conversation. Cause I actually really worry a lot about young artists and I feel like they need to know that the art community is a welcoming place. So that's always my focus there. And on Twitter, it's much more like jokes and, you know, so every platform is different. And that's why I always recommend when people are kind of like thinking about what platforms to post on to like use a platform for a while and find out which one works for you. And if you kind of get it, um, if it 
if you kind of get what it's about and have like a sense of what, what you like to see there, because then you can like tailor your content for it. And if you're on a platform and you like, don't get it, then you're probably better off not posting either because your post will maybe come across as tone deaf or you won't know how to use it in a way that kind of like gets, gets the engagement going. There's one thing that's kind of frustrating for me, like, which is stuff like Instagram, trying to understand it is the hard bit. Like you said, like I didn't know about how powerful stories were until I had a a session with somebody and I'm like, Oh, you don't use stories. Why? I'm like, I don't know. I don't have anything to say. Like, Oh, that's why you you know that here's how the algorithm works. If you'd have done stories, X, Y, Z happens. I'm like, huh, no one told me that. And you start doing these things and it's kind of like, oh, okay, there's, there is a behavior you have to do to make this platform work. Yeah, It's very hard for somebody telling you like, oh, do this, this and this, and you know, you'll get results. It's very um, methodical. You have to figure these things out. Yeah. But then at the same time, if you do it too methodically, I think people really sense that. I think people really mm-hmm. feel that it's not authentic and then you won't get the same amount of like of feedback. So that's why I always say like, you have to like it yourself. And, and people always feel obligated, you know, they're like, how do I make Instagram work? I don't like it. I don't, I don't know how it works. And then it's like, well, you don't, you don't have to use it. Like it might not be the best option, you know, because, um, it's like, it's pure suffering, you know, to like make a platform work when you're not feeling it really. And, and, um, there's, so, there's so many options, you know, I know that there are a lot of artists who are on discords now and on these little micro communities sharing their art there. And I think that that's like, for a lot of people works so much better because you have like real contact. Whereas with Instagram, you kind of feel like you're screaming into the void sometimes it's so hard to get noticed. So that's the thing about it. It's, it's like, it's a whole second job. It, it takes so much work, so much planning. It takes like a marketing strategy mindset to make it work. And it's, it's not for everyone. And if it takes away from your creativity, it takes away from your drawing time, then it might not be worth it, you know, for a lot of artists. There's a statement. I'm curious on your take on this. Um, the whole notion of, oh, if you do something you love for a living, you'll never work a day in your life. For me, I'm kind of like, nah, you know what? I, I do what I love. I'm a 3D artist. I love it. Some days feel like work. So it is a job. Some days are not fun. Is Do you get a sense of that? You're doing everything that you want to do. You're doing your own artwork. You're doing all the, like, the art you want to do. It does, you know, it still feels like work a lot of the time, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm really like, I mean, I try to kind of take the take it day by day and just have fun and do what you feel like approach. And and my email inbox just terrorized me every time I opened it. I was like, there's so much, how do I do this? Like, that's also a part of work, you know, like the planning part. And for me being a freelancer means that I have to do my taxes and like all the money stuff. So there's a lot of stuff of like, the, I think that saying is very naive because when you really want to make a job or make work out of your passion you have to approach it as a job like you can't just float through life unless somebody else is going to pick up all those tasks for you um which is i don't know like not an option for me you know you have people who are like i do what i want and then they have some like exhausted personal assistant running after them you know (laughs) i mean I just don't think that's realistic. Um, You have to approach it as work uh, because I think especially for artists, it's really important to emphasize that when you are doing art for your job, that doesn't mean that you are like simply pursuing your passion and and living in the moment. You are also a professional, just like an accountant is. And just like, you know, a car salesman is, we're all, it's a job. Are you able to somehow uh, compartmentalize your your personal time, personal work with uh, with work? And uh, for example, like in your case, you uh, you have the Instagram presence. So for me, it would seem like it would be a temptation to always be thinking about is this is this something I should post on, like I post a story about, and never give yourself a break and just like, uh, do you do that? Do you compartmentalize or do you just things come along, even though you weren't expecting to work and you're like, Oh, this is a work moment. I'll just capture this on video and post a story. Um, I usually, I plan it out as much as possible. I used to do that. I used to just post whenever actually last year I was still doing that. And then in like October or November, I decided to change, change my method. Cause it wasn't, wasn't working very well. Cause I felt guilty all the time. Like every time I hadn't posted something, I felt guilty. So I started just, um, spending Friday afternoon, like planning my social media posts for the week after 
and just literally writing the text, preparing the images, just having everything ready so that all I need to do is post it up. And then, and so now I post it up, takes like five minutes and then, um, like on all the platforms. And then I'm like sort of online for about half an hour responding to comments and seeing what comes in, um, seeing how it's received. And then I, then it's, it's done. I close it. And you close it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really important with social media to do that. You have to set boundaries because it, otherwise it just like becomes way too, like it absorbs your life too much. Um, and I've had moments where I, I get really sucked into some social media platforms. Like the more I use them, the more I realize like, this is what they're designed to do. You know, like there are moments that I got really into Twitter and then I was like on Twitter for like eight hours a day. And then I was like, this is why this is, this is now I get it. I get Twitter. Like I understand those those profiles where I get onto it and like people have tweeted stuff for like, like every five minutes, you know, and it's full of like really recent tweets. I was like, I, I know what that's like now. And then I literally have to put a limit on the amount of time or I have to uninstall the app for my phone. Cause it, it just isn't a productive way to use my time. So I have to keep an eye on that. I think there's a new Netflix documentary about, about the social media. It's algorithm. Terrifying. Yeah. Oh. I'm not going to watch it. I think. <laughs> But I know that like they are designed to be addictive and you really have to be careful in how you use them. You mentioned earlier that you have, uh, very quickly, you mentioned that you have a, a worry about younger artists. Uh, maybe you could dig a little bit more into that. Uh, yeah. So I've been working on my style for a while and I've been quite consistent in like drawing in it, but that was never the plan. Um, and when I was like, you know, up until I was, I went to art school, I just kind of like messed around with art. And just drew whatever. Um, I did like a stream last weekend for Lightbox where I talked about my old art and like there's like Powerpuff Girl Padme's. Like I used to draw Padme as a Powerpuff Girl because I liked Padme and Powerpuff Girls and I didn't think twice like whether that was a good idea. I just didn't care. I just had a lot of fun. I didn't end up realizing that uh, social media presence was like a you know, could be used as a source of income or a way to like connect with clients until I graduated from college when I was like 21. Um, and even then it took me like years and years to find interesting clients that I could really say like, yeah, I've worked for these names. Cause before that it was just random stuff. And that like that aspect of my career, just messing around and floating around, seeing what happens and not worrying too much about it like allowed me to find something that works for me. And I feel like young artists now like are already so talented and skilled. Like, you know, I see like 13 year old artists that are like incredibly talented. And like, I was still drawing Powerpuff Girl Padme's at age 16. Like I, what, there are 16 year old artists now that are like pro level. Um, so and, and the skill level that they have, and they're all on social media, comparing themselves to each other, looking at other artists and being like, that's how I want to do it. And you can see that a lot of them are looking at like formulas for success. So they look at an account that does well and they mimic it. And they think like, this is how I will be successful. And I see that there's a lot of pressure on young artists to to follow this route of success. There's a lot of pressure to make a, like a, a, t a decision on the, what their career should look like at a very young age. And there's, there's like a lot of competition. Um, everybody has access to incredible resources for learning. So everybody's incredibly skilled, it looks like. And I feel like there's not as much room as what I had when I was younger to just play around, have fun, experiment, and not think so much about where is this going? You know, should I, I see really young people come up to me and be like, should I work in this style moving forward? And that makes me sad because that's going to take away so much room for them to play and experiment and learn. Um, and the pressure on them is huge. So I always try to like, as a sort of, like, I try to, uh, have like, send out a vibe of like, it'll be okay. Like, just slow down, take it easy. Don't feel so bad. Don't put so much pressure on yourself because I feel like the other input that they're getting from the art community, like from portfolio reviews and industry events and stuff is that they should be pressuring themselves more. And I feel like somebody should be saying the opposite to them. Uh, there's very little, th this is something that this is uh, spotted recently. It's like people aren't aware of their own work habits and what works for them. Some people can do the whole, you know, I'm like this, I work a lot. And it's kind of like, I could do that. I'm happy to, I, you know, that's, I enjoy doing that. But some people can't do that. 
but then they put pressure on themselves to be like, no, but I should be doing that because that person's doing it. And I'm kind of like, especially with Instagram, any social media platform or art, you know, art showcasing platform, you're seeing all of the highlight reels and you're comparing yourself to the best of the best of the best. Like these are the 0.001% of the art community. You should not be comparing yourself to these. Yeah. And you're only going to see the best of each anyway. So like there are plenty of artists exactly. out there who are making awful sketches or who are having a horrible day or like having trouble finding work. They're not going to put that on their social media. You know, you, exactly. you're not going to see that. It's actually, influ- so this whole idea, because this is something that's is, is becoming more and more prevalent as, you know, speaking to younger artists and this whole issue of like, you know, oh, this person's amazing and I'm not, and this is very upsetting. It's even influenced the way we produce it. Like I'm sourcing learning content for our station. I'm like, show just me, show me you working as an artist, mistakes and all. Like if you're struggling to get this piece going, include that in the tutorial because then the people watching go, oh, this incredible artist does not go A to B. They go, they make 50 mistakes before they get to the final solution. And it's really influenced that sort of things. Cause I don't like to just, the tutorials are just scripted and like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I get yeah. my final piece. Cause that is not how art is made. Not in 3d, not in 2d, not anywhere. And it's really, I've, when I'm seeing these types of concepts and I'm giving, we're getting feedback from the community and they're saying, Oh, this is actually, yeah, this is actually helpful. Seeing people make mistakes. That's the important thing for me. I think like as artists, like psh, mistakes are good. Mistakes are where we learn, like show yeah. our mistakes as well as our, our highlights. Yeah, and our mediocre stuff too, right? Because mm. like everybody makes mediocre stuff from time to time, and it's like it's okay. Um, but yeah, I feel like that's not. It's hard to talk about that when all of those platforms are kind of tailored to only show your best stuff. So it is like a challenge because the alternative would be like you know sharing all your failures and sharing like negative things that doesn't work either so i feel like there's a certain change like a structural change that needs to take place in the art community itself as well where and i'm seeing that a lot that at events there are a lot of like mental health panels and there are a lot there are like many different kind of artists coming in and telling different kind of stories um, when i was first doing events it was a lot of the same stuff it was like a lot of like big industry people that were like, this is how it works. And now we're seeing like people developing careers in many different kinds of ways and telling individual stories. And I think that that helps younger people to see that there's not one path to success, um, that they need to find their own path to success. Uh, but it's like a thing that I'd like to see continue to change, like a movement within the art community where we don't, we not only focus on skill and success, but also on, you know, the psychology behind the creative process and a kind of like more diversity in the kind of like things that we call successful in the art community. That's something I've actually quite enjoyed about, you mentioned Discord earlier and like the micro communities. Yeah, It's something I've quite enjoyed recently. So I'm, I mean, I'm in a bunch of the 3D ones and it's kind of like, they all have personalities and you're able to find the communities that work for you. So there's some which are incredibly harsh. Like they're, it's very straight to the point. They'll tell you what's wrong and they'll be very blunt with you, which is yeah. fine. Like, you know, that, that for me, that works. And there's so much far more about like, oh, like how did you get there? You know, was it fun? And you focus on like the, the creative and the fun aspects of making art. And that's something to be quite nice about the micro communities is just seeing them actually have personalities. Because Instagram is just this big thing, like DeviantArt, Art Station, they're these big platforms. The micro communities within Discord, we get to see the personality of the communities come to life. And that's been quite like, I'm not very active in them, I'd, but I'd like to just lurk. But as you see, they have yeah. a life of their own, which is really weird. I think that that is sort of where the future of like these platforms lie, because that's something that I've heard being said for years now that like, Mm -hmm. because I give a social media workshop and every time I give one, I kind of like check what, like, what's the latest status on social media? Like what, what do people say is, is the future of social media. And for a while now, people have been saying like, yeah, the, the macro influencers, like the, the big, big influencers who have a huge name on social media are becoming less appealing to people. People are getting tired of it and they want to see like a more genuine connection with more small scale influencers. So that's how it's going with influencers, but it's the same with these communities, like these huge art communities that are like hyper saturated, like 
the Instagram art community is becoming less appealing to a lot of people and they're moving to these discords. They're moving to like the smaller ones because you have more genuine connection and you have, it's, it's much more like you're getting something in return for what you put in. Yeah. It's kind of what we were talking about the other day, Alex is like, you know, uh, when your friends are commenting on your work or mm. an artist that you really, really um, admire comments or, or gives you a thumbs up on a work that you did means a lot more than a whole bunch of people that you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Just actually, you spoke about the future of social media. I, this is only cool. So my, my wife loves TikTok. She's actually, she said the other day, she has like a, a million followers, a uh, million views as well. I'm like, <laughs> Jesus, that's crazy. But I'm like, you said, oh yeah, Instagram could blow up tomorrow. It could be gone. How do you have to think about like, oh, what's, because you say for Vine as well, Vine came and went. Um, yeah. Snapchat, I remember when I came on the scene, I laughed at it. I was like, this is ridiculous. No one's going to care mm-hmm. about this. And then it's huge and Instagram incorporate it. So yeah. do you have to keep an eye on the news? So, so for example, like I would say TikTok. Do you look at that as an artist and go, huh, can I put art on there? Is there a way to put art on there? Should I put art on there? Does that enter your mind or is it like, I just worry about the stuff I'm in control of right now? Um, well, me as a person, I'm not great at like picking up on trends. I'm usually the last to hop on a bandwagon or whatever. So, um, I'm not like great at keeping, really keeping up with that and strategizing how I could use that for myself. And like, I was really late to Instagram as well. It was like already huge when I joined. Um, so that was not the smartest move, but I do think about the, that stuff. Yeah. I have a TikTok account that I've like barely used and I'm like, I'm going to put more stuff on there guys, get ready. And I'm trying to like, kind of bring, bring people over there just in case, you know, like I am going to populate it some more, but I'm, I'm kind of testing it out. Like, is this something for me? Is this something I want to do? Uh, and I am like, Discord's also like, are not totally my thing. Um, cause I like posting and then leaving, you know, like what I said, I, I post at the time where most people are online and then I close it off and discord is like a constant, like it's a chat system. It's like, you have to keep up quite a lot. It's, I think it's meant to be used that like you have it open all day and kind of like write something in there from time to time. And that, that doesn't work so well for me. So there are like all these new things that are coming up that I'm like, Hmm, should I be doing this? Should I be I'm not that versatile, uh, but I do kind of keep it open and like keep an eye on it because it is, and I have like, um, you know, I talk with other artists about it a lot. Like what platform works for you? Like, what do you see happening? Because I do need to kind of know what's going on. Cause in the past, like the reason that I uh, have been able to build up so many followers is because I kind of took my followers from one platform to the next. So I was like, it started on DeviantArt for me. And then I went to Tumblr and I sort of like kind of tried to bring my DeviantArt followers with me. So I, I told them all like, yeah, I'm on Tumblr. And then from Tumblr, I kind of went to, uh, you know, to Twitter and to Instagram later. And I, I kind of like want to keep moving forward, you know, cause if you get stuck on one platform, like if I had stayed on DeviantArt and not moved forward from there, like, you know, uh, people are a lot less active on there now. So I do need to strategize, but it's not something that excites me. It's something that makes me incredibly nervous. <laughs> when I think mm-hmm. about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. And as you were describing before, I mean, it's all linked to your business and getting work and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So it's, it, it gets complex. Well, thanks so much for coming uh, on the on the show, Lois. Like it's been so cool to, to listen to your insights and your experience and learn from that. I've learned a lot. Um, for people uh, listening, they should for sure follow you on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you also have your website, lois.net. Um, I'm going to be posting up, but by the time that this goes live, probably my website will be renewed. So okay, I I haven't updated it in like four years or something and it's really outdated, but my new version is going to be awesome. Just had to say that. Cool. So yeah, by by now, so check that out. You'll, you'll see the brand new website. Um, not the one that I'm looking at right now, (laughs) which is, which is also fine. Um, Vimeo channel, uh, you're, of course you're on art station and Patreon, really important. So if you're, if you're a fan, uh, or if you just really want to support Lois and, and her work, please go visit her Patreon and subscribe. It doesn't cost that much per month and there's lots of great content. Um, you, you're pushing stuff quite regularly on Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm posting a tutorial every month and, uh, I put my art there first a month before I put it everywhere else. And I do process videos, step-by-steps, Q and A videos sometimes. So I put a lot on there. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots of lots of great stuff. So please go and visit that site and, uh, and help support Lois. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for coming on. I hope we have uh, another conversation sometime in the future. Thanks so much for having me. See you on ArtStation.com, the global hub for creative professionals. You've been listening to the ArtStation podcast. Hit subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. And please leave a rating and review for the podcast. We promise we'll read them all. See you next time.